Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for cooking classes without a kitchen. I'm going to leave up the instructions for uh, how to connect to audio while I do a short introduction, and we're going to get into the class. Uh, my name is Michael Balkenhall, and I'm the Health Programming Coordinator here at the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Middle Atlantic Region, um, otherwise known as the NNLM. Uh, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine is an outreach program of the National Library of Medicine. Um, the NLM um, is the world's largest biomedical library located on the campus of the National Institute of Health. Uh, they maintain and make available a vast print collection and produce electronic resources, information resources like Medline Plus and PubMed. At the NNLM, our mission is to provide equal access to biomedical information to health professionals as well as quality health information to the general public so that they are better able to make informed decisions about their health. We do this through resources on our website, the funding of projects, in-person trainings and webinars, including guest speakers uh, just like this one today. Um, back in April 2009, I had the opportunity to attend an in-person version of Cooking Classes Without a Kitchen at the Urban, Libraries, uh, Con Urban Librarians Conference in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and Patty and Chris uh, shared amazing ideas for using food in the library. Um, before I introduce Patty and Chris, um, a little bit of housekeeping. As you may have noticed, everyone is muted today upon entry. So please use the chat box, which is located in the bottom right corner of your screen, um, to participate and ask any questions. A link to the presentation will be shared um, throughout um, so that you can follow along or um, you'll have access to um, the resource list at the very end. Um, and if you are interested in um, receiving one credit of Medical Library Association um, continuing education credit, um, please take the survey at the end and the instructions are at the bottom. And with that, I'm going to introduce you to Chris and Patty. Um, Christopher Morgan. Um, is an adult programming and outreach librarian at Newburgh uh, Free Library. In addition to being a food and cooking program enthusiast, Christopher likes incorporating pop culture in library programs. And Patty Sussman has been a librarian for a long time and a foodie for even longer, currently serving as the collections development librarian at Newburgh Free Library. She loves how food and books bring people together. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Patty and Chris. Hello. Hi there, everyone. So my name is Patty Sussman. As Michael said, I work as a collection development librarian at Newburgh Free Library. And I guess you could classify me as a foodie. I love all kinds of food. My ethnic background is Italian and Japanese, two of my favorite food cultures. So I grew up with my Italian grandmother making homemade pizza while my mother was showing me how to make the perfect sushi rice. I also love ice cream, and my motto is, I will travel for the perfect soup. My name is Chris Morgan, and I'm the adult programming librarian at the Newburgh Free Library. Like Patty and almost every other librarian out there, I'm also a foodie. Before working at the Newburgh Free Library, I worked as a library clerk at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, and that really sparked my interest in food programming. Enough about us. We're going to talk about how libraries can use their space in ways not originally anticipated in order to offer food-related programs to their patrons. So, I, so this is a question that we ask at the Urban Libraries. Um, how many of your libraries host food or cooking programs in their library? And how many libraries have kitchen programming space in their library? Um, we host cooking programs, but we don't have a cooking space in our library. Um, don't feel bad. If if you don't, because that's why we're here today. So those of you who haven't offered food programs in your library before may ask, if you don't have a kitchen, why go to the trouble to offer food programs at your library at all? What does cooking have to do with libraries? Well, here are some reasons food and cooking programs can be beneficial to your community and are a natural fit for your library and your patrons. You can help patrons build health and nutrition literacy. Nutrition literacy is the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand nutrition information and skills needed in order to make appropriate nutrition decisions. Food programs focusing on healthy recipes 
help patrons develop nutrition literacy, and give them the ability to be able to make informed decisions for themselves and their families on, one, what they should be eating, two, how much they should be eating, and three, what foods they should be avoiding. In addition to nutrition, cooking classes can help give patrons an understanding of food systems. This is food literacy, which according to the Food Literacy Centers, is understanding the impact of your food choices on your health, the environment, and our economy. For instance, purchasing local over buying the strawberries from Chile. Every food purchase has its story, and it's important to know where your food comes from, how far it has traveled, and its cost to your local economy. By offering healthy food programs, you can aid your community by informing them on healthier ways of eating, buying, and empowering them to be a smart consumer. I love this quote from Siobhan Reardon, the director of the Free Library of Philadelphia. And you're going to hear that library mentioned a lot today because they're really at the vanguard of food programs and libraries. Um, the quote is, nothing is more literacy-based than cooking. It is all basic literacy, math, and science. It is tactile learning, and it is social. In addition to learning nutrition and the value, valuable life and potentially vocational skill of cooking, patrons also gain culinary literacy through food programs. And culinary literacy is tied to multiple other literacies. Cooking involves measurements, fractions, calorie counting, mathematics, science, botany and chemistry, experimentation, fine motor skills, reading recipes, which involves critical reading skills, transcribing new recipes, and technology skills as well. So every culture eats, but what they eat, the utensils used, and their rituals and rules surrounding food and special meals are shaped by historical factors, geography, social status, gender, tradition, and religion. Food programs are a great way to help build to help build patrons' cultural awareness of these factors. You can learn a lot about different cultures, their daily lives, and their history through cuisine. For instance, how Central and Western African cultures imported by slavery influenced soul food and other cooking in the American South. Or that people in hotter climates like India often eat spicy foods because it causes them to perspire, and that helps cool down their bodies. Newburgh has a wonderfully diverse community. The population is over 50% Hispanic or Latinx and 25% African American. We have Dominican, Indian, Honduran, Peruvian, Guatemalan, and Mexican restaurants within a mile or two of the library with delicious offerings that can be community partners. Having cultural programs in the library can be so wonderful. Your community can bond over shared food and gain cross-cultural knowledge. Okay, um, here's just a selection of flyers for past programs we've done at our library that were food programs. We've had that feature cuisines from different cultures. Um, the first is a flyer for a program we did with a local chef and cookbook author, uh, Norma Chang, that featured Asian recipes and also talked about gluten-free diets, which of course are always of interest. Um, the second is a cooking program that we held for teens. Um, Food programs are great to do for teens. It's a great skill to have as they enter their adult lives. And at this age, some of them might already be responsible for cooking for people in their household or themselves. Um, and lastly, a good program we did that was a partnership was um, we had a chef in our area do uh, soul food uh, recipes with uh, heart-healthy heart alternatives. And that was co-sponsored by the American Red Cross. Food programs also meet the social needs of patrons. Food programs can remove the barrier between audience and presenter and help create a sense of community as your patrons collaborate and share a meal or snack together. In fact, there's even a 2017 NPR link on how eating the same food increases people's trust and cooperation with each other. The more familiar you become with an unfamiliar food, the less intimidating it is. Isn't that true about anything? NPR had an interview with one of their social science correspondents that talked about an experiment that found people feel closer to those who eat the same food they do in close quarters than to those who are eating something different. And that sense of closeness results in trust, cooperation, and a sense of community. And if nothing else, by offering a food program at your library, um, 
you're also having the benefit of providing food to your patrons. And there's a very good chance that some of your patrons are experiencing food scarcity. So if anything else, you're providing them with a meal, snack, or sustenance for some temporary relief, and of course, a little fun. Um, when we do food programs at our library, we have a lot of patrons experiencing um, homelessness, and we kind of intentionally leave flyers in areas where the homeless patrons in our library congregate so that they know there's a food program going on, and often they're there and they ask us about when they're coming up and things like that. Um, and last but not least, Food programs are super, super fun. And all us as library programmers out there know that they draw a crowd. I can say from my personal experience that food programs always seem to fill up the quickest and draw a lot of interest. Um, who doesn't love food? <laughs> and adding food programs to your calendar may be a nice way to boost attendance uh, for your library's programming staff or to bring in new patrons to your library that might not attend another program. In order to get the type of food programming you think you should be offering to your community, sometimes you have to look at the data. Coined as a phrase in the 1990s, food deserts, as defined by the American Nutrition Association, are areas in the country that lack an adequate supply of fresh fruits, vegetables, and other healthy whole foods, usually in impoverished areas, largely due to a lack of grocery stores, farmers markets, and other healthy food providers. However, an interesting new study, new study that came out in 2018 says it's not that simple. Healthy eating disparities come from income class and education, as well as geography. In geography of poverty and nutrition, food deserts and food choices across the United States, we find that nutritional inequality has less to do with the supply of supermarkets in a neighborhood, in a neighborhood than with the demand for healthier foods by its residents. Their findings suggest that education, nutritional knowledge, and regional food preferences play a far larger role in nutritional inequality than access issues. Libraries can certainly do what we can to provide more opportunities for nutrition literacy and education. All right, this is the Food Access Research Atlas, um, formerly the Food Desert Locator. The Food Access Research Atlas pre, uh, presents a spatial overview of food access indicators for low income and other census tracts using different measures of supermarket accessibility, um, provides food access data for populations within census tracts, and offers census tract level data on food access that can be downloaded for community planning or research purposes, i.e. your library's planning for food programs. Um, what can you do with the atlas? Uh, you can create maps showing food access indicators by census tract using different measures of indicators of supermarket accessibility, um, view indicators of food access for selected subpopulations, and compare and download census tract level data on food access measures. Another reason why getting an accurate census count matters. The food environment, environment atlas can be used in conjunction with the food access atlas. Also from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service, it provides a wide set of statistics on food choices, health and well-being, and community characteristics for all communities in the United States. The Atlas allows users to map a community's ability to access healthy food and to download the data into Microsoft Excel format. Data layers include availability of food assistance programs, store availability, food prices, state food insecurity, socioeconomic characteristics, and health and physical activity. Um, this is a clip that we had. Um, it's a link in the, um, in, at the end of the program, but it's, it's a nice video that explains another resource called Map the Meal Gap. So through one of their resources, um, there's this map that we have that, that we found that, that our library serves an area with over 61,000 food insecure people, with 37% of the population above SNAP threshold of 200% poverty. All right. Uh, the number one question you get when you bring up food programs to librarians is, what about health codes? Because lots of librarians love rules. Um, and there isn't an easy blanket answer to that question. Every city and municipality is different. If you're unsure of what the health code regulations are for your library, call and check with your city or county department of health and ask. Uh, they may require that you get a special permit, uh, like a food vendor permit, 
or that your instructors be serve safe certified food handlers. Um, and I'll say real quickly that I think a lot of libraries out there skip this step, but it's really up to the discretion of your board of trustees and your administration for your library what you decide to go forward with. So um, here's, here's a course called the Serve Safe Food Handler, Handler class. And um, I recommend this course um, if, you're, if you're going to consider doing food programs. I took this course. It takes about two hours and it's available in English and Spanish. The food sections are basic food safety, personal hygiene, cross-contamination and allergens, time and temperature, and last but not least, cleaning and sanitation. You must complete these sections before the assessment is available, and the cost is $15 per person. Something you might want to consider assembling for your library is a kitchen in the box kit. Um, this comes from the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, as you probably know, their library has an amazing commercial grade kitchen to offer food programming in their main library. Um, but they also have a lot of branch libraries, so they create kitchen in the box kits to offer culinary literacy programs in neighborhood branch libraries. Um, with this kit, as long as you have an outlet, a table, and running water, you can offer a plethora of food programs. This is a great list for a budget conscious library. The complete list of items would cost your library about $700. And you really can decide for yourselves which items you want from here. I mean, there are some basics that you absolutely need, but some things are a little bit more um, arbitrary for uh, your set. Um, so this is something you could possibly ask your friends, group, or administration to fund, or you could try to apply for a grant. And also, another great thing about this is the entire kit can fit within a large lid plastic storage bin, so it's easy for storage or transportation for a library that's space concerns. Put out by the California State Library, the Lunch at the Library site has great ideas for how to get this program at your library. And if you already have it, ideas for providing programs, including possibly feeding the caregivers of the children who come for this program. Another great resource is Hunger Solutions New York State Resources. Their motto is, to be read, you must be well fed. The Pew Research Center has reported that while most Americans know where their local library is, many are unfamiliar with all the services libraries offer. Lunch at the Library provides librarians with great opportunities to introduce families to their services and resources, as well as helping them feel and become more healthy. It's a win-win situation. You can also piggyback off of this to have nutrition, nutritional literacy programs as well as offering programming to get the students to come in to have the healthy meals. With a decentralization regrant from the New York State's Arts Council, we offered Art Start, which was a series of weekly art programs held over the summer um, that was held at the library between 10 and 2, 10 and 2, PM, 2 p.m., offering various art projects drawing families in at the right time to participate in the lunch program, and it also coordinated with our summer reading program. So um, you don't have to be the one cooking if this is something that's new to you or cooking is not your strong suit. Food programs are a great opportunity to partner with people, businesses, or organizations in your community who may have equipment, appliances, or certain expertise that you don't have who are used to giving food and cooking demonstrations. Your library may be a great opportunity for nonprofits or organizations to connect with members of the community or for a small business to get the word out there about themselves. It's a win-win situation for both the library and the community partner. The first potential partner I'm going to mention is supermarket dietitians. Check around your local grocery and supermarket chains to see if any have an in-store dietitian. They're often willing to do uh, complimentary nutrition and cooking demonstrations for libraries. One example is the ShopRite Dietitian Program. Um, actually, this past spring at Newburgh, we had the ShopRite Dietitian come and do a whole presentation on nutrition and cooking for diabetics. Um, they also do lessons about shopping in the supermarket and advice on what products to buy. Um, you can also reach out to local hospitals and clinical dietitians in your community to see if they'd be willing to do nutrition at class or cooking demo for your library's outreach. Another option is to work with food banks or food pantries. They also frequently have cooking or nutrition educators on staff. We've worked with the Food Bank of the Hudson Valley, who've, who've had one of their Just Say Yes to Fruits and Vegetables SNAP educators 
offer food classes at our library. And one of the great things about working with them is that they've dis distributed fresh produce to patrons who've attended their classes at the library. This photo is from a summer salad class we offered in July, and all att attendants left with fresh basil, tomatoes, and other veggies. Also, you can connect with your local nonprofits, for instance, farmers markets. We also had a table at the Urban Farming Fair in Newburgh a few months ago. Cornell Cooperative Extension offers great food and gardening programs to libraries at low cost. And don't forget to reach out to local branches of health organizations like the American Health and Heart Association and American Diabetes Association as well. Yeah, and that, um, that partnership with the Urban Farming Fair grew. And actually this past summer, we, they started a youth pop-up farmer's market that the farmer's market completely run by teens that was here a couple days a week for two hours a day selling fresh produce, and that was really, really popular it and a great partnership. Nice. Yeah, a lot of staff used it too. <laughs> yep. Um, restaurants or other small businesses, so, and local schools with culinary, food, science, and nutrition programs. There's also, there's also your local small business community. They may be a restaurant owner, a personal chef, health coach, or caterer willing to have a chef demonstrate a recipe at your library to get some exposure for their business. Also, reach out to local schools or colleges with culinary, food science, or nutrition programs. In the Hudson Valley, we're so lucky to have the Culinary Institute of America, which is a point of pride for our region. Reach out and see if it would be possible to have a culinary instructor offer a course at your library. Oh, someone's saying they partnered with their State Department of Agriculture. Oh, that's, that's cool. really interesting. That's cool. Uh, last but not least, um, you can reach out to local cookbook authors and health coaches. Authors are often willing to do programs at libraries if they can sell their book afterwards. And one tip I'll just include really quick is if you have an author at your library, make sure you buy your book, their book and have it in your collection because if it's in your uh, promotional materials, people are probably going to request the book. Yeah. Um, there's a cookbook by Norma Chang who showed up earlier. Um, she does a lot of um, Chinese recipes. Then uh, Kim Hendrickson, the author of the Tastefully Small Cookbook series, offered a chocolate tasting class at our library, which you can imagine was pretty popular. And then an upcoming program we're doing this um, November is with Rinku uh, Bhattacharya. She's the author of Instant Indian, and it's a cookbook of instant pot um, Indian recipes. So it's also great to have a, a collection of local author cookbooks at your library if you can. This is another possible. All right, so here are some examples of programs that don't require a kitchen. Potluck. Um, you're putting a lot of trust in your patrons when you have patrons bring in the food. We, ha we both have reservations about food safety, at least in the library. You can see how the sausage gets made, and you don't have to worry about whether the food has been stored or transported safely. Um, a really simple program that you can offer at your library is uh, knife skills and culinary safety. Um, so some food programs can be about the food preparation and the skill you need to have in order to cook and prepare food safely, and not really about the food portion itself. Uh, knife skills are really a pretty large foundational skill for cooking. Knowing how to hold a knife, how to hold a food while you're chopping can prevent unnecessary injuries. Also knowing that, plus some basic techniques for slicing, dicing, and mincing, can help your patrons become much more efficient and expedient chefs and enable them to widen their recipe repertoire. Um, another fantastic suggestion we got when we offered this program at the Urban Libraries Conference in Brooklyn was partnering with your local fire department and do a program on uh, fire safety in your kitchen and um, how to look out for faulty wires with devices and things like that. That was a really good idea. Um, also, I had to include this because I love fake library statistics. <laughs> um, let's keep the injuries to cat attacks and try to reduce the cake cutting incidents in libraries. <laughs> this is another basic skill essential to nutrition literacy that your patrons may not be fortunate enough to have. It's a very important um, and, and a very easy program to do, and all it requires is a few food products with food labels. It's another great opportunity to work with a food bank or a grocery store dietitian that they can bring in sample food products to demonstrate. Some libraries have had staff members visit food pantries to offer classes on how to read a food label 
or to provide print, health, and nutrition literacy information to clients. Um, here's another fun idea for a program that you can use to reach out to really um, millennials or really anyone that enjoys a good cocktail without violating your uh, local liquor laws or forcing your library to get an alcohol permit is mocktails. You know, there's really some fun drink ideas you can make using uh, fruit juice, different kinds of recipes. Just a fun idea and really, really low tech. All you need a lot for a lot of them is a bottler and a shaker. So now we're going to talk about some more complicated um, equipment but you can really do a lot with. Um, so we're going to go over some kitchen gizmos, gadgets, and doodads that are easy for you to bring in to offer food programs at your library. They vary in affordability, but your food program can give your patrons the opportunity to try before they buy and see if a product is something they actually like to use before they buy it. Um, you can take this opportunity to show patrons how to look up appliance ratings and reviews and consumer reports as well if your library has that. Oh, and someone said they did mocktails this summer at their library and that was popular. I That's bet it cool. was. We want to do it here really badly. Don't forget the latest kitchen gadgets. I think it's nice to have programs on the newest kitchen tools that come out so people know whether they're worth it or not. People can get intimidated, and it's nice to have them try it before they buy it. Um, this spiralizer is a great gadget for people who are on low carbs, low carb diets, and just thinking of your veggie in a different light. The spiralizer I use is the Paderno Spiral veg Vegetable slice Slicer you can get off of Amazon for less than $25. And unfortunately for you guys, when we did this in person, Patty actually was using the spiralizer and making a salad for people in the audience to try as we were presenting. Unfortunately, we can't do that in the digital version. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a spiralizer program last, last spring to promote National Salad Month. In the span of an hour, I introduced the product, put it together, and made four different recipes, spiralizing zucchini, cucumbers, and beets. First, I just spiralized the zoodles with spaghetti sauce as a healthy alternative to pasta. Doodles with pesto, tomato, and mozzarella, a raw beef salad with mandarin oranges, and lastly, an Asian cucumber salad. We'll be trying, oh, I, I still have it in there. We'll be trying a spiralized <laughs> recipe at the end of the presentation. No, we won't. A nice idea would be even to raffle off a hand spiralizer at the end of a program. You think they're definitely on the more affordable end in terms of gadgets for... And it really is good if you haven't tried it yourself. Spiralizing is great. And to get people to try different veggies than they would normally. Now we're going to talk about Instant Pots. If you don't have one, one, most of you are probably at least familiar with it. It was a top-selling kitchen device on Amazon on Black Friday, and there's been a surge of proper popularity in Instant Pot cookbooks. This is a great multifaceted cooking device since it's a pressure cooker, slow cooker, rice cooker, yogurt maker, steamer, warmer, and saute pan, all in one. And the latest ones, I think, have sous vide, too. Wow. So you can feature one or more of these functions in a food program. There's such a variety of things you can make in it, from basics like hard-boiled eggs to soups to main meals to cheesecake. It's a great device for patrons to consider who may have limited space or an apartment without a stove. How cool someone's planning an Instant Pot healthy cooking program this winter. Oh, good. I yeah, hope it goes well. Well, listen to uh, our program. This is actually what brought us together as uh, programming partners in the first place. <laughs> this is the first program that we collaborated on together. Um, at first, Patty was skeptical. Since my idea for a program, they wanted to do a whole Thanksgiving dinner in an hour. And she wisely encouraged me to change the program title to Thanksgiving in an instant. Um, we had a lot of fun with this program. Patty made butternut squash soup and mold cider ahead of time for patrons to sample. And I made mashed potatoes and uh, then later made a turkey breast and gravy in my Instant Pot, while Patty made a cranberry sauce in hers. We got a lot of positive feedback on this program. Um, one woman who attended had an Instant Pot for seven months and kept it in the box because she was afraid to use it, and said that after this program, she felt comf confident taking it out of the box and cooking with it, um, which she did. And uh, several others let us know afterwards that they were encouraged to buy this one. Do we get recipes? Oh, um, if oh. our contact information is up there, we still have them on our um, our library's Pinterest page. Oh, yeah. So if you reach out to us, we'd be happy to share them. Oh, good. One of the librarian's husbands is coming in. Kudos for that. <laughs> <laughs> so food processes, food processes, emergent blenders, and nutribullets and blenders. Oh, my. 
So these appliances all perform similar tasks, and some can be used interchangeably for some recipes, but there are some nuanced differences that make them better suited to different recipes. Blenders are great for things you want in a fine puree, like soups and smoothies. Immersion blenders are less powerful, but are great for easy cleanup or blending a recipe when you wouldn't mind some chunks or texture. Food processes are great for salsa, pesto, and hummus. Recipes that are less liquidy but require ingredients reduced to a finely chopped texture. More interesting gadgets that can help you make the perfect sauce, soup, sauces, and healthy smoothies for your audience. We partnered with local nutritionist and raw chef Bella Garrison, who brought her Vitamix blender and proceeded to make the most delicious and healthy smoothies. A mixture of the perfect diet season and weather brought over 60 people to the library that day. A few times a year, we host a book talk cafe where patrons have tea, coffee, and desserts and discuss staff book recommendations for the upcoming season. This past winter, we offered a winter reading challenge, and instead of our usual desserts, we had a Super Bowl right before Super Bowl weekend, which featured a variety of winter soups that fit in perfectly with the cold winter weather and our winter reading program. I'm just going to answer a question we got real quick from Kathy. Um, do you have a budget for ingredients and tableware? And we actually have, um, as part of our programming budget, we have a PO open with our local grocery store. And that's where we go for food ingredients and for uh, tableware we need. All right. And speaking of Super Bowl, um, actually, sorry. I'm just going to go forward a little bit real quick. The air fryer is another extremely popular appliance. Last year, about 4 million were sold. Um, the, the name's a little bit of a misnomer since they don't fry food, but they cook food really quickly with hot air convection. Um, this gives you what you're making a crispy exterior that you get with fried foods, but usually only use a tablespoon of oil, which lowers the fat content and the calories significantly in the recipe. That's not to say the food is more nutritious, but it's healthier than what you get from a deep fried alternative. Um, so air fryers are typically used to cook things you'd usually uh, cook in a fryer, like fries, onion rings, chicken wings, etc. cetera. Um, but they can also be used to cook vegetables and other meats. And so a program we'd love to do, and I think we're just thinking about doing next year with one of our staff members that has uh, air fryer at home, is air fryer Super Bowl party, where they different snacks using the air fryer. All right, um, so we all know breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And there's a lot of breakfast recipes that you can do with just some equipment in your library. Um, with a waffle iron, toaster, electric griddle, or if you're feeling fancy, a crepe maker, you can teach your patrons some recipes that they can use to get a healthy start to their day. Um, also, since I'm mentioning waffles and I'm a librarian, I couldn't help but include a lovely note quote from Parks and Recreation. <laughs> I think Pancake Day is actually on Thursday. I saw something from the Demco calendar. Ah. Um, and speaking of breakfast, you can also have a program about coffee at your library. Um, some devices that you could bring in are the AeroPress, the French Press, pour-over coffee, um, like a drip coffee, and um, coffee machine. Uh, coffee is an easy thing to make, but sometimes a lot of people spend a lot of money on coffee daily without thinking much about it. This program can go over the various ways patrons can prepare coffee to their tastes, whether it be French press coffee, pour over coffee, drip coffee, cold brew, etc. Um, a fridge with a freezer is probably one thing that most every library has. Obviously, there are different logistics considered when it comes to prog uh, food programs involving making frozen foods. Uh, if your program involves making fro uh, frozen goods, they might, the patrons might have to pick them up later once they are frozen. Um, something we did this year for our end of summer reading party was cake pops. So uh, we put them in our freezer temporarily, so patron, but it wasn't very long, so that the uh, chocolate out on the outside of the cake pop could set before the patrons brought them home. All right, we've got some, someone did fancy coffee on the cheap, and people loved it. Oh, I'm interested in knowing about that one. <laughs> uh, do you include any history of the foods or equipment when we did the Instant Pot, we talked about the, like, the kind of the rollout of the device and the mechanics of it and how it worked a little bit. And um, actually, with the Thanksgiving, we did talk about the culinary history of Thanksgiving. It yeah. was fun. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it depends on the program. So microwaves are another appliance most libraries have. There are plenty of ideas for meal prep solely using the microwave. 
And microwaves can also provide major assistance and other types of food programs as well. If you've been on Pinterest ever, uh, chances are you've seen a recipe for a mug cake or a mug meal. They've gotten super popular over the past few years. They're super easy recipes that are convenient because the mug's the only dish you have to clean. They're easy to make and they make a single serving. Um, they only require a mug and a microwave to make. They might not be the most nutritious options always, but they're convenient to the home chef. This looks so appealing, right? My son is currently at SUNY Albany and he hates the food. There are plenty of ideas on Pinterest and books on the topic of dorm room cuisine. And now lots of dorm rooms just restrict to microwaves, so that's all you're using. This would be a good program to have alongside other college prep or adulting courses. And this is just a fun potential what we did was how to dress up your ramen because we know college students get a steady intake of ramen noodles when they're there. And there's a really some simple like trips you can do that really can make them taste a lot better and a little bit more variety. Uh, we get a comment, um, muffin tin cookbooks. That sounds interesting. And someone did a taco chip mug for their story time. That's really cool. All right. So this is a microwave food program that we did at our library. Um, I offered this class at the Newburgh Library the day before Valentine's Day this year. Um, I didn't know before I looked into it how to offer a chocolate making class without a kitchen, but I did and found out you can make, make chocolate truffles using just a microwave. For this program, I had to prepare the chocolate ahead of time to make sure it was cool enough for patrons to use in time, but I explained how to go about doing it. Um, so for this program, the patrons rolled out truffles of milk or dark chocolate and then rolled them into chopped nuts, coconut, or cocoa powder for coating. Um, patrons were able to take chocolates home for themselves or for their Valentine. Uh, we had a question about uh, waivers for food allergies. No, but we usually have the recipes at the, the get-go and mention all the ingredients that we're going to be cooking with and trust the patrons if they do have a food allergy would excuse themselves if it was serious enough. We don't make anyone sign anything or anything like that. Um, obviously, you can't bake cookies or a cake without an oven, um, and you usually can't decorate cakes or cookies until they've cooled off a little bit. But you can have patrons decorate cakes and cookies if you do the prep beforehand. So um, this involves making the cakes or cookies at home and bringing them in, and then having the patrons learn how to decorate it. This December, we had a holiday recipe swap and cookie decorating program at Newburgh. It was fun and an easy all-ages program. We had several pr families attend and take their cookies home with them. We have, um, we, they tried a cookbook club, and they would like to produce their own uh, library cookbook. That's really cool. We'd like to do something like that, too. We, we did, I did try a cookbook program, but I was, in, I was the only one ending up at just, at our, at our library, I was the only one that ended up cooking. and There were a lot of people that came without bringing stuff in. Yes. That wanted so it was to, like. It was you were feeding the masses. Yes. <laughs> but that would be really great to put together your own cookbook. Yeah. I love that idea. Forget about the cooking altogether. It's all about chopping and mixing the ingredients. Based on the raw food diet, it is eating uncooked or unprocessed foods based on the idea that cooking produces toxic byproducts and a raw diet will provide the most nutrients to the body. We partnered with the founder of Green Conscious Kids to offer a raw food program. Um, you can see the photos a little bit. So um, that was a program targeted towards youth that was all about how to raw food diet and how to make different recipes. It was pretty popular. Just volunteered for a cupcake decorating bar at the local museum this year. Ooh. A cupcake decorating bar. That sounds super that, cool. That does sound good. And what about for cake decorating, use form and cover with cling wrap, then a microwave to create fondant. I have never uh, made fondant before. That's interesting. We're looking forward to your cooking pro program. Yeah, please. <laughs> After this is done, if you go out there and do some food programs, Please share them with us because we're always looking for new ideas and librarians love to steal from each other. <laughs> and please steal from us too. <laughs> so here are some libraries who are killing it with food programs. The Maitland Public Library in Florida has a monthly cultural cooks program 
where area chefs from different cultures will offer cooking demonstrations featuring cuisines from different countries and cultures. Inspired by a visit to the nearby Culinary Literacy Center at the Free Library of Philadelphia, this director decided to develop a mobile culinary literacy program for Camden County Library System called Books and Cooks. The program, which began in late 2016, was initially funded through a one-year $59,000 grant from the New Jersey Department of Labor and Workforce Development Adult Literacy and Community Library Partnership Pilot Program. Books and Cooks Mobile Kitchen, the cost is about $9,000, travels to each of the library's eight branches, as well as the Camden County One-Stop Career Center and Camden County College. Um, someone just mentioned they did a Frito pie program at their library that over 200 kids attended. That sounds awesome. I've never had a Frito pie. Um, and then there was also one about um, a library that does a barbecue class every summer to kick off summer reading. Those are oh, really I love cool. that idea. I love that idea. Yeah, I would love to learn how to grill. Um, oh, this one, this library increased traffic by using historical recipes. Oh, that's really cool. I made recipe cards to give out. That's neat. And tacos. Who doesn't love tacos? Yeah, who doesn't <laughs> love tacos? All right. This is another similar um, library uh, program. The San Francisco Public Library has a mobile kitchen they call their Biblio Bistro, and I love that name, um, which they use to offer food and cooking demonstrations at farmer's markets to show how local produce can be used in recipes. Uh, this is the winner of the 2019 Upstart Innovation Award. In 2018, the Southern Adirondack Library Systems Outreach Services, um, Services Program, and it, was, and it was called the Comfort Food Community, and it was based in Greenwich, Greenwich, which is part of Washington County, New York. And they joined together to make available fresh produce fruits and vegetables from local farms to patrons visiting three small town libraries, which are part of the consortium of 34 libraries. There's some more cool comments we're getting. I'm loving reading these guys. Um, Fizz Boom Read Summer Reading Program. It was food science based. That sounds really cool. Um, and then someone's doing a baking bacon class for making bacon from scratch. That's really cool too. Oh my goodness. I love that. Oh, I want to come. Cart. I've never heard of a Charlie cart before. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to look into that, I think. Yeah. OK. And I've mentioned them a thousand times already. <laughs> but the Free Library of Philadelphia really served as a great inspiration and informational resource for us in our food programming. Um, they're known for offering the country's first commercial grade kitchen classroom in a library. But they've great, got great ideas and ideas for food programming, regardless of what your programming facility is like. And any food program you can imagine, they're probably already doing. And they have a great toolkit assembled that's, in, I think, in our links as well. But if you're looking for ideas, it's great to get started with reading that. Somebody mentioned that they had a cosplay cookie decorating program for teens. Love that idea. The teens could dress as their favorite characters as well as decorate character cookies. I'd love to see pictures from that. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Tips for running a food program yourself. First off, as I always tell Patty when she <laughs> is take a deep breath. <laughs> um, here's another tip um, that, that when you talked about the history and, and, and stuff like that, we have that question, is have a time killer or some kind of activity while the food is cooking. For example, food trivia. Talk about health tips and benefits. Watch a video or movie. Do a craft. Play a game. Try your recipes beforehand and have something ready to snack on while people are waiting. Also, make sure patrons register so you have some kind of head count. You don't want to have too much or too little food. Um, encourage patrons to bring Tupperware with them if there's food to take home, uh, so you don't have to give, like, have a environmentally unfriendly disposable containers or their expensive alternatives. Um, print the recipe for your patrons, uh, and ask your patrons to notify you of any food allergies, like, kind of like the question we got before. Herb tasting. Oh, that's really cool. Um, that is really cool. Spice blends. I'm always Googling how to make, like, saison goya and how to make, like, Italian seasoning. That's really cool, too. Love your, love your ideas. Yeah. 
Thanks, everybody. And sorry if we missed any along the way. We're trying to read them as we're going along. Oh, and kosher-friendly items. Kosher-friendly really, items, yeah. yeah. Also, a reminder to promote your cookbook collections. Don't forget to promote um, your your cookbooks with any of your food food presentations. Yeah, we've got a little slip of a uh, little uh, screenshot of Hoopla too, which is great because we're doing that for a program because anyone can check it out. Usually, they're it's metered, so yeah, most people can have the same cookbook out at once. With a banquet from Harry Potter. Oh, oh that's cool. So um, this is a great cookbook. It's called Eat Well on Four Dollars a Day, Good and Cheap by Leanne Brown, and it was designed for people living on SNAP or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. While not all recipes can be produced without a kitchen, a lot can be reproduced in the Instant Pot. Also, the English and Spanish version of this cookbook are available as free PDFs online. Another one, our uh, Vegetarian Sushi and Candy Sushi Program. Ooh, candy sushi is interesting. All right, another thing is to recognize your own biases and food preferences. Your tastes are not the same as other patrons, uh, as your patrons and your coworkers. Be open-minded. <laughs> so here is a picture, and actually speaking of sushi, yeah. a picture of a spaghetti donut, which I had at Smorgasburg in Brooklyn, and to uh, an Italian like Patty was uh, an ethna. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Um, picture of sushi because I personally don't like sushi. I know that's an unpopular thing, but that's just my own hang-up. Yes, we do have a link for the free books. If it's not if it's not at the um, end, um, we do have a link for it, so we can make sure that that gets sent. Does any library loan Instapot funders Nutribullets? I'm sure some libraries do. I've seen um, specifically like libraries that are just like li uh, loaning cooking equipment all over the place, or just like you know, um, that, like they're usually member libraries, I think, or subscription libraries. We have to do that. Um, Vegetarian Vietnamese spring roll and made hummus, and the kiddos and the kiddos with raw veggies. Parents and kids loved it. Mmm. So um, now that you're the expert, take your cooking programs out on the road and show your community what your library can offer. Um, do cooking demonstrations at food banks and pantries, schools, farmers markets, street fairs, other tabling events. Really kind of dispel the traditional idea of what a library is, about the limits of what a library can be. Consider targeting food programs towards different populations. Food programs are flexible and can be adapted to accommodate or target different audiences or populations of patrons. And last but not least, don't panic and have fun. It's easy to get stressed when it comes to cooking, but keep in mind that you set the tone and your patrons will only have as much fun as you are. So try not to panic, take a deep breath, and try to enjoy yourself. And we're going to close with a quote from the culinary goddess, uh, Julia Child. Never apologize for your cooking. Um, it's all fun, so don't get too stressed about it. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being our audience for this presentation. And here's a list of useful links that feature some of the things you mentioned along the way. If we don't have the PDF for the for the um, snapbook, we'll send it along. All right, um, we can do some more, uh, try to answer some more questions in the chat if uh, people would like. I think we have some time left, I don't know. Oh, you're, you're also welcome, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your great ideas. Yeah, I know. The comments had great ideas know, for I, programs. I, we were actually just looking at how to save the, uh, how to save the chat ourselves. Please send us your success stories. We want to hear about the food programs you do. <laughs> uh, we're both on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, too, if anyone wants to look us up and add us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. OK, everyone, thanks. I'm going to close the, uh, oh, it looks like we have one last We post them on our Pinterest account. Sorry. And it looks like anything that we didn't address um, in the next two or three weeks, we're going to send out a recording to everyone who registered, um, and we'll make sure that we include uh, the links from today as well. Um, I'm going to post one last time a link where you can grab a PDF of the presentation. Um, looks like, do we have any last questions? No oh, disaster okay. stories. <laughs> uh, not yet, fingers crossed, and <laughs> toes crossed, everything crossed.
And it is little things that come up now and then, but never nothing then becomes a complete disaster because part of the fun of cooking is being flexible and adapting and making the most of what you've got. Well, Patty and Chris, okay. thanks so much for sharing uh, your presentation again. It was really, really yeah, Thank you, Michael. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, and we'll hang out for another minute or so. Everyone, you're welcome to, to leave. When you exit, you'll have a, a short evaluation, um, a s small survey. Um, please fill it out. Um, and if you need uh, MLACE, um, the link is there as well. But we'll hang out for maybe a minute in case anyone's typing a question. And then we'll, we'll end the webinar. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.